Welcome to ALD Stories, a series of conversations where we share the untold stories of atomic layer deposition and the people behind the technology. This podcast is brought to you by Benek, the home of ALD. Welcome everyone to ALD Stories. Once again, uh, today, uh, I'm pleased to have our very own Katja Vaudenen with us. Hi Katja, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks feeling, for the invite. Feeling good today? Yeah, good. Hey, uh, before we get started, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us what uh, a little bit about you. So, as you said, my name is Katja Vaurunen, and I'm working as a process development engineer here at Benek. And I've been with the company now for two years. And my background is uh, that I have a PhD in materials chemistry. Mm-hmm. I was doing research at the Helsinki ALD group in at the Helsinki University before this. And there, my research topic was the process development, the ALD process development of cobalt, nickel and copper metal thin films. Okay, well, that sounds uh, pretty interesting, pretty heavy stuff. Hey, let me ask you this. Anybody in your family that's a chemist? No, actually, I'm the first PhD in my family also. But my sister, uh, she's a teacher in math, physics, and chemistry. And she had a, a bit of a role in steering me towards chemistry also. So when I didn't know what to do after high school, she suggested that, hey, maybe maybe you could, you could go study chemistry and figure figure things out from there. And, uh, well, that, that's... Uh... That's a nice story in itself. Actually, I'd like to ask you more about that. But let me ask you this. I mean, chemistry is a very broad subject, right? So how did you specifically steer yourself into uh, what you are now, an ALD scientist? Uh, That's a good question. Because actually, when people start to study chemistry, it is very difficult to really know what are the topics that are studied at the university, let alone all chemistry. So when I had done two years of chemistry studies, I had to choose or apply for a position for research training. And I again <laughs> went to my sister and asked like, which, which, which um, group should I go for and what should I do? And she had just taken a Professor Mikko Ritalas inorganic chemistry course. And she told me that, hey, that guy seemed quite smart. Maybe you, maybe you could ask him if if you could uh, join his group, and that's that's how I got into ALD. So it's pretty pretty much by chance. But then once I got into that group, I got to uh, study ALD, and I found out how interesting the technique is, and how much potential it has in applications, and also it already has ha- had at that time industrial importance so that's not a given for all uh, areas of chemistry so yeah I, I think I think ALD in reality has really taken off especially lately I mean it's it's something that's inherent in in Finland it was developed largely here so um, it, I think it's natural that now it's all of a sudden taken off and there's more and more interest associated with it it's also in itself I think a very broad category so within ALD, right, what, uh, what are you specifically interested on, on ALD? Uh, I'm still interested in process development mainly. Okay. So if there are new publications, I usually tend to look at the ones that um, are telling, telling about new precursors or new processes. And of course, now given my job here at Benek, I'm also looking at materials and processes that are rele- relevant to my job now and also the more than more applications, so like power devices or MEMS. And then, of course, if I have some customer case, then I have to look at literature related to that specific case. So, for example, uh, check how the process behaves on a specific substrate, substrate or what kind of process tuning could I do to achieve some properties, for example. Right. But process development is also still still very close to my heart. Yeah, I mean, uh, ALD is 
straight it's a huge subject i agree with you and probably there's a lot of i mean if there's any subject i think i agree with you that chemistry and ald sort of go hand by hand so i want to congratulate you on the fact that uh, you were selected to this uh, young chemist network in in europe um why don't you tell me more a little bit to the audience what does that entail how did you get involved in it so the european young chemist network is a youth division of the European Chemical Society, so EU Chems. And I got involved when uh, Professor Marco Leskela, also from, from the Helsinki ALD group, asked me if I wanted to be the next Finnish delegate for the network because he's very much involved with EU Chems and also the Finnish Chemical Society. And the point of the EYCN is to unite young chemists across Europe. So there are delegates from all, all European countries. And then we also have different targets, like for example, bringing chemistry to a wider audience. So even people who are not in chemi- or working in chemistry would like uh, get, to know, get to know about chemistry more and learn, learn new things. So even though it's not related to my to ALD in any way or to my job here at Benek, I thought that it's a good chance to meet new people and do networking and learn other soft skills as well and and promote promote chemistry in Europe. So do you guys have anything planned? I mean, any get-togethers in the near future? Now that, of course, we're all in this pandemic thing going on, we have to do things differently now. So do you guys have anything planned in the near future? Uh, the... USCN has a delegate assembly every year, and usually it's in some in some European country. But of course, now it's going to be online. But then the network also has other other tasks, like it's divided into teams, and each team is doing different things. So I'm not sure about all all the different things going on right now. But I'm myself. I'm with the networks team, so we do a lot of publishing. So. For example, if there is an online event that is specified or targeted to young chemists, for example, so then I write write an article about that. And then the network is all the time, it has like podcast also, and it's promoting awards and contests and webinars for young scientists or young chemists in social media and so on. So let's, um, let's follow that thought a little bit because it looks like... Um... Part of what you're doing is actually, you know, promoting chemistry, and I'm sure they're going to, we're going to have a lot of people in here listening to you, uh, students as well. Um, let's go back to when you started studying chemistry. I think what was the most surprising, or perhaps, uh, you know, in your journey from from the beginning towards your PhD. You know, what 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 uh, what were some of your struggles and victories, if you will, during the uh, during the process. Do you mean during the process? Yeah, I just tell us something PhD? about your yeah. Your I'm I'm interested in your experience during your training as a PhD chemist. Well, one frustrating thing at least is that when I first started with the PhD or doing the doing the PhD studies, it was very difficult because the subject was difficult. I didn't have many precursors for the metals available neither the metal precursors or the reducing agents. So it was difficult to come up with what to test. And also when I did test something, I usually got no no results. So I didn't have much to characterize and um, I was feeling a lot of pressure like in terms of time because it's quite a restricted time that you have to do your PhD before your funding gets cut, cut out, for example. So I was feeling a lot of pressure before before things started to get rolling. Although I was actually in the in a quite lucky position because I had quite solid funding from from ASM, but then it's not the case for all PhD students. So some some people have to apply for grants every year and really really struggle for the money. So maybe you can help me and, and the audience understand. So what was your study exactly? As I understand you did uh, transition metals yeah and specifically like late first row transition metals so cobalt nickel and copper okay 
And uh, how did it go? I mean, did you find anything surprising in there? I mean, in general, what, what was your, you know, any surprising findings or, or struggles? Well, one surprising fact may be that even though this was my topic, like these specific metals, and I was always aiming at making the pure metal thin film, but then actually, in, mo in many cases, I had to kind of go around, for example, um, we de developed this one or member in our group, Dr. Timo Hatampa, developed this good cobalt precursor. So we weren't able at the time to use it for making cobalt metal, but then we made cobalt oxide instead. And also at some point we had an idea of using a tin hydride chemical to make cobalt metal. And actually we got metallic film and I was super excited. But then as it turned out, it wasn't pure metal, but instead it was like this intermetallic cobalt tin film. So it's surprising sometimes that even though you don't get the exact result that you aim for or, or wish for, and you still get good findings and interesting stuff and you can still incorporate them in your PhD. One thing that uh, that the audience may or may not be aware of is that in semiconductors, of course, now things are getting smaller and smaller, and, and there's, of course, uh, the interconnects in between are all these metal lines, if you were very small, that are actually stacked in several layers. Um, how does ALD, what do you think the future of ALD is, is, is here? Is it, is it going to, are we all going to eventually have to use ALD to do all these metal interconnects? Um, <clears throat> and what are the well, advantages, of course, you know, of, of doing this through ALD? Well, at least I think that ALD can be used in some parts of preparing the interconnects. Like even now, the liner and diffusion barrier layers like nitride or tantalum nitride are often made by CVD. And I think in maybe in some cases also by ALD, of course, it's difficult to know for certainty what is going on with the companies. But then, as you said, metals are much, much more difficult. And I think the importance of ALD is at the very lowest level. So the very narrowest interconnect dimensions where cobalt could be used, for example. So when I started um, this idea of using, started doing my PhD, this idea of using cobalt at the interconnect low levels had just actually appeared. And then at, at, at the same time as I was doing my research, there were also other groups doing similar research and many companies also developing new precursors all the time. So cobalt ALD was was quite new at, at that time, but it is now growing all the time. And even though we don't have a ready-made solution yet, I am, I am optimistic that at some day there will be a thermal ALD cobalt process that could be maybe used. And even here, maybe it, it cannot be used for doing the entire filling of the interconnect, but maybe like a seed layer for for subsequent deposition, for example, for making better, better material and and so on. Fascinating stuff. I mean, I'm going to show my age a little bit, saying that when I was working in the fab, I think all the interconnects used to be aluminum. And, uh, and then at one point, people started looking at copper, right? And listening to you, I think the future here is in cobalt. But... Um, Help us understand why do we need cobalt? I mean, what, what, what are the advantages, for example, of cobalt over aluminum or over copper? So at these very narrow dimensions, even though copper has lower bulk resistivity, then actually in these dimensions, the resistivity is not as low anymore because there is more electron scattering. And also copper is more prone to electron migration that then leads to faulty wires and um, decreases the reliability of the interconnect. So cobalt or some other metals also, like ruthenium, for example, could replace copper in these small dimensions because um, they don't suffer from electron scattering as much. So actually, they would have a better lower resistivity. 
and also they don't suffer from electron migration as much. One quick question. Um, what is the availability of some of these precursors, by the way? Is it something that's uh, readily available or are we talking about some very specialized sort of like still R&D type of precursors for cobalt, for example? There are both. So some some of these like carbonyl uh, chemicals are readily available and I don't think they are very expensive either. But I don't know how well that would actually work because they are a lot used in CBD, but uh, but their use in ALD might lead to uh, carbon and oxygen contamination. Oh, yeah. So maybe that's not so good good for this. But but uh, when I was doing my PhD, um, I did some cooperation with, with companies and they were all the time developing new ones. So definitely there is strong pull for new cobalt, cobalt precursors also. Super fascinating stuff. Thanks for... Uh, for you know, going into so much detail regarding this. And, well, it looks like you're the inherent chemist. You were born to be a chemist. Um, but let's, you know, it's something that we always ask, you know, that people that come in here is like, let's say that you weren't a chemist. Let's say you had another opportunity to do something different. What what would you do if you weren't an ALD chemist? Well, when I was in school, I was interested in many different things. So, Natural sciences were always close to my heart, but I also have a passion for languages. So when I was thinking about what to do, I wanted a job where I could combine combine like many different things. And actually, I think my current job in ALD, especially when working in industries, is a good combination of these. But then maybe it would be something similar where I could uh, combine many, many different um, inspirations and that might be like a reporter or a journalist well very good I think maybe in the future you can start doing some of the podcasts myself <laughs> <laughs> since you're very good at it you're very good at uh, communicating and I appreciate your time over here and I think with this we're going to wrap it up and I thank you very much for, for being here and um, I hope that uh, maybe in the future we can have you again so this is uh, Patrick Gonzalez for Katja Baudinen. Thank you very much again for being with us. Thanks. You're listening to ALD Stories with Benek, the home of ALD. To stay tuned for new episodes, make sure to follow us on Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Apple Podcasts. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Talk to you in the next one.